Welcome back to the third section of the virtual roundtable organized by Rise and Lead Women, where we are discussing the myth, impact, and the way forward of COVID-19 in Africa. Today, we will be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on job security, careers, and small businesses. The last two sections, we handled the impact of COVID-19 on food security. And um, today, this morning, earlier today, we talked about uh, uh, the impact on digital security in communication and how we manage information. You know, we are so uh, happy with the people who, I mean, who have been participating and some of you are already here. Thank you for joining us. And most importantly, thank you for the engagement. Your questions are helping us to shape policies. The articles we are going to write after all of this, you know, just remember that your voice counts. So I'm going to ask those who are joining us now that I hope you engage. Use the chat box. You already know where it is. In case you don't know where it is, it's on the right, uh, it's on the bottom. Just use it now and tell us your name and where you are calling in from. And when you're typing in your name, please remember to make sure that you're selecting to all panelists and, uh, and, and um, participants so that everybody, you can start interacting among each other. That's very helpful for us. Uh, so the purpose of this meeting is to gain a better understanding of the COVID situation, particularly in Africa. So we know that COVID-19 has hit the whole world and it's, you know, it's uh, showing up in different ways in different countries. So we want to look about the unique situation in Africa. And, and here today, uh, we have people from different uh, countries in Africa, which makes it more interesting. So we want to hear your opinion about what is happening uh, with you. So the idea is for us to get tips that can help us manage this situation, especially our livelihood. We need to manage it. We need to survive. We need to thrive. So let's discuss and find ways we can all work with this together. And for those who are joining us for the first time, let me introduce myself. My name is Ebere Akadiri, and I am the founder of Rise and Lead Women, a leadership organization located in Europe and in Africa. I'm also the CEO of Ataro Foods, located in the Netherlands. And uh, Ataro Foods packages West African spices and introduces uh, Nigerian <coughs> cuisine to people in Europe. And um, I'm a Nigerian and I moved to the Netherlands uh, six years ago with my family on job related transfer. And with me today is Busayo Bamibola, who is uh, the governance um, consultant with uh, KPMG. And she's also the head of speakers of Rise and Lead Women. Uh, Busayo is going to be my uh, co host today for this virtual roundtable. Busayo, welcome. Say hello to uh, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Okay. And joining us will be Mrs. Adua Kufro Owusu. Adua is the Regional Advisor on Gender and Women's Rights, United Nations. And Adua will, you know, she has also worked in Nigeria. Let me find her bio, full bio. Adua has worked um, in Nigeria to support research, policy work, partnerships, and advocacy. But right now, uh, in her capacity as the Regional Advisor on Gender and Women's Rights, United Nations, she has worked with the United Nations in various positions at headquarters and in the field. She is really passionate about women's rights, about uh, everything about human rights, about children, you know, forced marriages, violence against girls and, and in schools, violence against women. And we are happy to have her. Adua, so welcome. We are happy to have you join us today. So say hello to the audience. Thank you so much. And it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be part of this panel. And I look forward to the discussions and welcome participants. Thank you. Yeah. The next person here with us is uh, Funke. Oladuke. 
Uh, Funke is a partner with Deloitte and uh, she is a partner in the tax and regulatory services division of Deloitte and Touch Nigeria. She has a deep experience in providing tax and regulatory services to multinational, small and medium enterprises and non-government organizations. Uh, so Funke, are you here with us? Sister. Yes, good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon everyone, this is Funke. It's uh, good to be part of this discussion. Hello everyone once again. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Funke. Thanks for coming. Uh, so with me, with us again is Adebola Kupuloyi. Um, Adebola is a senior manager of finance operations in, in at American Towers, where she manages 30 plus team members and ensures there are adequate controls in place in disbursement of yearly operational maintenance. She's also the founder of Mantle of Modekaya Foundation, a registered nonprofit with a mission to reduce the population of out of school children in Nigeria. And also, she's also uh, the, the country chair of Rise and Lead Women Africa. So, uh, Adebola, we're happy to have you here with us. Say hello to everyone, Adebola. Okay, my, yeah. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Adibola once again. Thank you so much for being part of this. We do not take it for granted. I look forward to the engaging discussions and I hope that we have one or two things to learn from our time today. Thank you once again. Thank you. But do you know if we have Ada with us? Yes, we do. Yes. The inside? Yes. She's okay, right. so Ada, uh, next person is Ada, Ada Irikefe, right? Right. Ada is an associate director at PwC. Ada is a director in the disruption practice with over 20 years experience as a business IT professional across multiple verticals. Ada, it's good to have you. Thank you, Abere. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this platform. Look forward to the engagement in the next 90 minutes. Thank you so much, Ada. And uh, before I bring up all our speakers uh, to start asking them questions, um, I'd like to you know, share with you the background about why we are here. Uh, so when the COVID-19 spread all over the world, I know it affected so many of us in different ways. Some of us are afraid of losing our jobs. Some have lost their livelihoods. Some of our small businesses uh, depending on the sector, they don't know, they, they have no income anymore. And for us, our Rise and Lead Women, it was our, our first time coming to Africa. We wanted to have a summit in Lagos that was uh, supposed to take place on the 29th of March. Um, fortunately, I couldn't come. I already had my ticket. Adua was supposed to come there with her team uh, from the United Nations, uh, from the AU, so many of us we are planning to come to Lagos for this gathering called Rising Leaders Africa. We were forced to cancel it and postpone it. So we're still looking forward to meeting all of you in Lagos. Uh, so my organization Rise and Lead, we decided to organize a series of webinars to engage our community, to engage everyone, to find out how you are, you know, to give you a platform to raise your voice bring your suggestion, your opinion on how you think we can all work out uh, uh, this situation, this crisis together, because no one has all the answers. But if we work together, I know we can survive, we can thrive, we can support uh, one another. This is why that we are discussing about the issue of job security. It is important to our li livelihood. If we lose our jobs, for example, how are we going to feed? No matter how our relatives support us, there are also people who are supporting us, who are depending on us. How are we going to help them? So I don't know what, uh, if this pandemic persists, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's discuss. We have called experts, uh, professionals, uh, UN representatives to discuss and share with us um, what, what should we, how are we going to survive how are we going to continue with our businesses? How are people who may likely lose their jobs 
uh, be paid? You know, what is going to happen in Africa differently to make everybody uh, uh, have a normal lifestyle during this problem? We also know that the isolation is causing a lot of stress. So that's why we are here today to bring you together to at least have this conversation to reduce the stress and to get some tips on how you can help yourself and also help people back home. So once again, thank you for joining us. And usually what I do before we start is that I like to engage everyone. So today I didn't do any poll. Uh, maybe because we are just, we were busy to come and serve you, but I want you to type inside the chat box, you know. Um, I like everyone, even those we were supposed to be on Facebook, but it wasn't working, so we're all here on Zoom. I want to ask that on a scale of 1 to 10, with, with 10 being the best, how does the current situation make you feel? Are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling like, I don't know how to survive after now? Um, just type it inside the chat box. We're going to look at what you're saying. Uh, we didn't do any poll like we did in the first two, but uh, it's also a way to keep communicating. So we appreciate if you can type inside the chat box, how does this current situation make you feel? Type in the comment box. Please. And now I'm going to bring up our speakers, our panelists. <clears throat> I also want to, <clears throat> excuse me. I also want to introduce myself as one of the panelists. Let me drink some water. <clears throat> I do not have COVID-19, trust me. I've been in my house all day. <laughs> you know, it's it become a problem now. You can't even come outside. People will look at you in a funny way. Oh my God. <clears throat> so just know that I don't have it. And you're not close to me anyway, even if I did. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to bring up our panelists. And I, I want you to know that I'll, I'm also one of the panelists. And I'll be speaking. I'll be answering your questions about small businesses. So if you have questions about small businesses, I'll be helping you answer those questions and also some of our consultants can help us do that. So my first question goes to Mrs. Adwa. Uh, Adwa, can you tell us a bit, uh, let me change the view. So Adwa, I would like you, uh, as a UN official, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you and your institution? And can you tell us a bit about the work that the uh, regional office in the United Nations Human Rights, which is your office, you know, what are you doing to support African women dealing with this pandemic? Thank you so much, Eberi. Um, and um, I will start off saying I'm not obviously, I'm not representing the UN. I'm here to also share my experience and my personal views. And what's evolving. I'm based in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, okay. and um, since the first part of your question, now uh, how it's impacted, I'm actually, as we speak, I'm participating from um, from the UK. So this gives you a sense of what's how it's impacted on us. Um, the organisation is teleworking. Most of us are working remotely, and um, a lot of us are in our duty stations. Um, we talk about even those in peacekeeping missions, and this includes women with families and children with caregiving duties, who, if we take South Sudan or Somalia, they usually have four, um, in Somalia, they have four weeks, and in Sudan, South Sudan, they have six weeks, um, what we call r, &R cycle, which is um, rest and recuperation, because you're away from your family, you are in a non-family duty station, and now I have colleagues in these countries who have not been able to leave because of um, COVID-19, who are now on a, a lockdown and have not seen their families for several weeks. Um, in what, and, and these are some of the stresses that even women working for the UN in non-family situations are facing. There are no flights. Their families are on a lockdown without their moms, um, which one of their one of the main um, givers 
So this is really having a challenge on, on staff, on the women. Uh, externally, what we are doing as an office is immediately that this um, COVID was declared as a pandemic. Um, a lot of the work we have done is trying to identify the different impacts on women. And not just on women, the gendered impacts, how it, it impacts differently on men and women. And then how can that inform policies and responses in our support to member states? So if you take, for example, um, now we work with the African Union, they, they have a gender directorate, and we are trying to come up with a policy brief with some guidelines and steps that member states can take to make sure in their response and preparedness in Africa, the women's concerns are not left behind and that the different impacts, should it be lockdown um, on our con in our country, should it be closure of markets or even closure of school, how would that impact differently on women and men and to put into place measures that can reflect these different impacts. So we are doing it at the AU level, but we are also at the regional level, but we are also doing it at the country level. So policies, guidelines, and advisory services, both to member states, but I'm speaking from the Human Rights Office. So we also work with other UN um, agencies and sister agencies, for instance, UNICEF, UN Women, other partners, and we work with the UNC to UNDP to make sure all their programs and all their responses also mainstream human rights, which means women's rights, because women's rights, as we know, are human rights. So these are some of the actions we are taking at this stage. Thank you very much, uh, Adua. Thanks so much for the uh, answer. So I now go over to Funke. Funke, as a workplace professional uh, in the consulting firm, how has this COVID-19 affected you and your industry plus your clients? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, that's a very <laughs> good question. I think we all agree that um, this is a very unique time um, that we are in. I, I'm not. I'm not sure how many people have experienced such in, in their lifetime. I mean, maybe this most senior citizens can share in. And so, for uh, the first, we've had to be at home for an extent period of time so it's a bit um, it's a bit new um, because again um, I mean when you look at it we, we as a policy I mean in, in the firm we've had some form of you know um, flexible work arrangements where people can actually you know work from home in certain circumstances but in a situation where we have to be at home for three weeks now it's it's kind of um, unique but the good thing about you're breaking up you're breaking up a bit we can't hear you very well so uh so we have we interface with both clients and the tax authority now can you hear now it's better now yeah. yes we can hear you now okay so so, so I was just saying that this is a very unique situation that we found ourselves in. But as we are, we are, I mean, we are consultants, we need to find a way to manage the situation. So in terms of um, clients, we are leveraging a lot on technology. So we have, you know, um, a lot of um, conversations with them online. I mean, via, in all the facilities that you have around. And for the tax authorities, they've been very proactive uh, because they've also... They saw this coming, and so they put in some measures, you know, to in place to ensure that the dialogue continues. So, yeah, it's it's challenging, but we're finding a way around around it. Thank you so much, Funke. So now let's go over to Ada Irekefe. Ada, you're also from the consulting firm. Can you tell us how COVID nineteen has affected you, your industry, and your clients? Okay. Um. Thank you, Barry. Um. I probably would echo the same as Funke. Um, we've been lucky to have in place um, flexi working. And um, as Funke had mentioned, <laughs> the flexi working policy that was in place was, uh, should I say casual, 
casual in the sense that you have, you can take two days off a month or you can work two days from home. Um, what we're currently facing is where we're working. I mean, I've been on isolation from, this is my 30th day. Um, so it's very unusual for me. Uh, but notwithstanding, I've been lucky and I guess my organization has, um, we've been lucky in the sense that we've invested heavily in digital technology and also upskilling our staff. Not just our staff, we've also um, passed on the same <clears throat> upskill to, our, to some of our clients. So it has somewhat been business as usual, somewhat, I would say. Um, as you'd appreciate. Um, things like um, stakeholder management and relationship management require some level of face-to-face. -face. Um, but I guess our clients and also our staff are quite understanding of, of the, um, the situation. In terms of how it's affected me personally, um, your, uh, one of the things I mean, you, you talk about myths. Um, I would like to dispel a myth here. Um, most people would say that work from home is extremely fancy. Work from home isn't fancy at all. Um, it's hard work. It yeah. involves a lot of discipline. It's yeah. um, it have been extremely busy trying to juggle my day job. And my day job has spanned beyond the usual eight, nine hours. It's like 10, 12 hours. And also running a home and making sure that, you know, we're rationing food supplies. We're actually rationing food supplies uh, because the so-called usual supplies are not readily available. And then mm -hmm. also my teenagers who can't understand why, you know, you have to be up at 8, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. even though you're working from home. Um, so it's been an interesting times for us here. Um, from an organization perspective, Perspective, um, I would say kudos to uh, PwC. Um, there has been regular communication. There has been uh, a recent initiative that has been put in place um, called PwC Cares, where we're um, looking at our societal values and saying, what can we do for the society? Um, I probably will talk more about that, um, but it's around you know, donating to um, the funds out there. Um, Part of it is obviously donating our professional services and also donating cash. But it's been interesting times. Interesting times. Thank you. Thank, very, you. thank you very much. You know, um, so uh, we, are look, we are listening to CNBC and they mentioned that over 20 million Africans will, have, will, will likely lose their jobs by the end of the pandemic. 20 million. And uh, within one month, 22, because they are looking at in the U.S. that within a month, 22 million Americans have already lost their jobs, erasing more than 10 years of U.S. job creation. So my question to, you know, the panel, and everybody can answer this or jump in if you have an answer, is how prepared is the African workforce for this instability? How are we preparing to safeguard jobs so that people do not lose their jobs? So let's start. Who wants to go first? Uh, shall I call on? Uh, okay, if I, if I can. Okay, if I can, if I can go first, right? So, so um, if you know, I mean, the kind of business that we do or we are into, um, our greatest um, resource are our people, right? So. So there's a need for us to um, to safeguard you know, whatever they I mean they already have I mean in terms of employment. So I mean for now we 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 are aware that people are a bit um, people are jittery people are panicking, and you know what we just try to do is I mean as often as possible we engage with them to let them know that look this this is a situation that is going to pass right. And so we will not be in a in a hurry to to, to 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 I mean to lay off our people because we are having challenging times. I mean that, that's how people test how loyal you are also to them, right? So you don't want a situation whereby there's a small. I mean we don't know when this is going to end, but as as it is now, 
we, we, what we try to do is to encourage people to let them know that look, your job is, is you know, your job is safe. Just try and focus on the on the on the work. Try to service clients, you know. And um, I mean that that's it. Because again, you need people to be mentally stable. So if you're working from home and you're hearing all manner of things, you know, uh, some people are challenged. You know, they have uh, resource constraints and all manner of things. So the last thing you want to hear is um, emails going out, you know, from management saying, okay, you know, this is, this is what is happening. I mean, people are going to, um, a, lot, a lot has been said about mental health, you know, recently, you don't even know what anybody is going through. You don't know who is depressed because they said you can't even see it. When you, when you look at somebody, you don't know what the person is going through. So I, I think it would be unfair at this point, but the reality, if I, if I just, um, let me just uh, send that note of warning is that if this continues, maybe in another one year or two years, I mean, the reality is that something will have to be done, but it must be an, it must be an engaging conversation with employees. Mm. What is the best thing to do and how do we uh, manage the situation? I think, I think that's the way we are looking at it. Thank you very much. What about Ada? What is your company doing to uh, protect your employees? Okay, so at the, at the moment, um, it's a, should I say business as usual? Um, obviously, we're, we're looking at areas where, you know, we have excesses, for instance, you know, we're just being, uh, uh, being cautious. Um, but like I said, we've always, we already have a policy um, where uh, with flexible working. So it hasn't really impacted us just yet. The one thing I know that um, the company is doing very well is communicating and just testing the polls of, of um, the staff, you know, from a mental well-being to, uh, a phys to also physical and readiness well-being. Um, I mean, we've all been encouraged to use this downtime to, um, to train, to upskill ourselves. Um, the beauty of working with, uh, uh, with uh, professional services, you get to upskill, you know, as often as you can. You know, they say that your career is in your hands. So that we're encouraged to use this so-called, I don't want to call it downtime, but <laughs> so-called um, quiet time, should I say, to, to uh, bring ourselves up, up to speed. Um, I guess from uh, looking at it from a wider wider context. Um, in a way, um, the pandemic has brought about a silver, silver lining. Um, if I was to look at it from a SME perspective, um, we, we can't but help um, notice that or feel that if you do not have sufficient digital footprint, survival is actually going to be quite uh, mi minimal. So we're encouraged um, SMEs to actually also tap into all the various free resources that are available out there. There's the MIT, there's HBS, there's even, we also have some on our, on our PwC website. It's really a period to just upskill and upgrade your, your knowledge in whatever um, situation or whatever um, areas you find yourself in. Thank, Thank you. Very Thank you very much. Let me jump over to Adebola because you spoke uh, about upskilling yourself. And so my question to Adebola is, as a career woman, you know, we're not leaving out the small businesses. I'm still going to talk about it. But as a career woman, uh, what do you think that professionals should start doing now to retain their jobs and also to get ready for the future of work? Because things may not come back to normal. Yeah. So what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I'll just take a cue from what um, Ada said um, earlier. It's important that we upskill. If you have not been upskilling, you've not worked in consulting, you're in a regular organization where training and development wasn't, and development wasn't key. This is the time to invest in it. And like Ada said, there are so many free resources that they are in fact overwhelming for me. You see a link today, this, today. There are, there are so many waivers even going on in organizations right now. So you're a career woman. You've been thinking of doing your MBA. We are hearing of Ivy League schools right now that are saying, you know what? We are waving GMAT and GRE. That's a good opportunity to quickly plug in. And, you know, knowing that that barrier that was preventing you from doing that is no longer there. Beyond even 
you know, upskilling, also be visible in your organization. So you will realize that yes, we are working from home, but some people use this opportunity to just be silent and you know, they are not really doing anything. A lot of things that we do, AI can replace us, but there are some things that you will do that AI cannot replace. So, I mean, there, there, was a, there was a survey by the World Economic Forum where they talked about the top skills for 2020 and he had problem solving, critical thinking, um, critical thinking and um, people management. Those are skills that AI cannot replace. So you need yeah. to be visible. As a, as a manager, manage your people well. Let executive management see you as a key resource. So even if this pandemic goes on forever and they have to downsize, they will look at you as a key strategic resource and they would, you know, they would consider keeping you. Beyond even staying in an organization, you can, you can delve into other things. So I tell people that the best way to actually make money is to be a social innovator. That means look for a problem around you and solve it. Even in your career, look for a problem in your organization to solve that nobody could solve. In the environment with this pandemic, a lot of people are cashing in. Netflix is cash, cashing in, Zoom is cashing in. Even yeah. in Nigeria, like, okay, people selling fresh food, they are cashing in. Yeah, yeah. are cashing in. Yes, you are in the nine to five. These are viable organizations to invest your salary in. So there, there, are, so, yeah. there are so many ways to skin the cat. There are so many ways to be relevant as a career woman and sustain your finance. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'm coming to Adwa right now because I know that your agency is so uh, working about financial inclusion for women. And uh, I'm not trying to exclude men. Men are here as well. But I'm asking specifically uh, some of the good work you've done in uh, helping uh, rural women, helping women who are nobody is helping just to make sure there is, uh, uh, there is no inequality, you know, like uh, financial inequality. Uh, what is their faith now? What, what, how, what, what are you going to advise? women especially those who have these small businesses in the kiosk in small in the villages and if they lose income once companies don't have money there is no liquidity in the economy people don't have money to spend small businesses will go down please what is your advice should we be afraid what should we prepare for please um I don't think we should be afraid. But before I go, thank you, Eberi. I just, um, from Ada and Adebole's, um, I think I'm already inspired on how I can make myself more visible. But I just wanted to say, also, I think there is an issue of time and the value of time. Yeah. And, and yes, it's very, it's, we are being told as an organization as well that use this time to have skills, to complete all the trainings, mm -hmm. to perhaps enhance now we are looking at the issue of health pandemics and what are the human rights implications for that in, in implementing the agenda 2030 agenda 2030 and then working with the AU to see how this will impact on the implementation of agenda 2063 and how we may have missed some of the important things but I think it's um, it's really important to also factor in the issue of time because there is only 24 hours in the day and teleworking, at least for us, is really teleworking. Mm. There are a lot yeah. of, um, of um, telephone, teleconferences, and you want to be seen. So it's combining the housework that all of a sudden you are home. So now you're expected to do, whereas you would have been in the office, and then expected to do the hours that you were doing in the office. So I think time poverty, I am experiencing that personally, um, having been teleconferencing. Yeah teleworking for the last um, four weeks that the issue of time poverty is real for women and this is also we have to factor in when we're encouraging women to upskill to look at other avenues and to take advantage of this lockdown um but on the issue of um of the women who are most likely to be left behind because they are not in the urban centers they are not in our cities um where most of the attention, at least in Africa, the response has been focused on major urban centers, on what's happening, even food distribution, we've seen by this are taking place in our, in our major cities. And those who are living in villages and in communities are being left behind, and not just um, women, but also women health workers as well, who work in these communities and who are very much at risk. 
are also being left behind. As I said at the beginning, what we are really doing as an office, OACHR, and because we look at the most vulnerable in our societies, even in when there is no pandemic, even in our normal work, we are looking at those people that are not seen. So we have, we've been looking at homeless people on our streets in Africa, in many countries, they have a huge population. We've been looking at those living in really congested environments, the um, what we so-called slums, but these are um, some of the set, but these people living in really congested settings and who have to be who have to share facilities. Um, what happens? And then and then those communities where there are no water, where women have to queue for a long time to to cure water. And we know water is really one of the essential things, not only for our daily living, but if we are to prevent the spread of this COVID. So we are looking at that and we are saying to, when we talk to our counterparts, the relevant government departments, that it's all well and good, all this preparedness, but make sure that those people are not left behind in your responses, that all the messages that we are producing on prevention reach these women and also contain languages that are not of the official language of the country. Because what else we've noticed is that many of the materials on how to wash your hands mm -hmm. uh, are, are produced in the official languages. Um, and we know in Africa that many communities do not, especially women who are often illiterate, do not, are not educated in the official languages and do not get these messages. We also talk about women, what, um, we are talking about how radio messages, what time of day they go out and to make sure women are also are able to hear. So these are some, we've had, we've had a few good practices. As an office, we have a network of women human rights defenders who are monitors and they have been sending us some of the challenges that women are facing in these communities and how that, that can be addressed. So we are really supporting and um, dissemination of key messages to vulnerable groups to in languages that are accessible. We've even in Ethiopia, we've done it even for Braille to make sure persons with disabilities are not left behind as well. Or even those who move and trying to talk about internal migration, because we know in our countries, many people move from the, from the villages to the cities. And now with this uncertainty, with, the move, with no movement of goods, a lot of people are also being moved or being returned. So this we are also very much concerned with. And finally, also the issue of migrants being sent back. We've had a lot of cases now on our continent of migrant workers from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia, from Lebanon, being sent back to our country without necessary health screeners. And we know 90% of migrant workers coming from these regions are women and girls. And then coming back without health screening and being quarantined and being at a higher risk. And then they are being sent back to these communities these isolated communities who by rights should be really quite protected and should not come across contacts with this COVID. But when you get these migrants who have been dropped in our cities and then going back to their villages, back to their countries, back to their home and taking that with them. Um, so these are some of the challenges we are facing. But as I said, we are, we are very much part of a lot of standard government preparedness that many, country, many countries on our continent have prepared. We are supporting them to make sure nobody's left behind. Thank you very much. Um, I see a hand raised. Uh, we are going to come to the Q&A section in your lap and just keep your hand raised and we will call you up to ask your questions. But now I'm going to uh, give the, uh, the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pass it on to Busayo because she's also looking at the questions that people have typed in and some specific questions for career women. Uh, so um, for, for all of us. So Busayo, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, and to the speakers, thank you so much and participants as well. There couldn't have been a better time to have this discussion. Um, anxieties are heightened globally on an individual basis as well. Personally, I'm confused. Uh, some of us had routines a few weeks ago that we had built up for years, and all of a sudden things have changed, you know, in the blink of an eye. Uh, we're also trying to get used to this new normal. Um, people have lost jobs, you know, people have lost businesses as well. 
And um, it's taken a lot, you know, for people to come to terms with the fact that things are going to change seriously. And um, what I found out personally is that um, what helps at times like this is clarity. And I believe that's what these discussions are about, you know, trying to give people some sort of sound advice and clarity on the next steps. Um, my first question, because we've talked about career women um, quite a bit, um, is actually for the small business owners and it's to uh, Mrs. Akadiri. Um, so you own a small business and I'd just like you, also, like you to tell us, you know, help us understand how small business owners can pivot their businesses right now at this time, just to ensure that we remain relevant. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I live in the Netherlands, like I said, um, I own a small business. I also consult for small business development. And so um, when this issue happened, and because I have a community, we have a lot of women in our Rise and Lake community here in the Netherlands and within Europe. Uh, so we did kind of a survey to find out what is going on. Uh, we found out that most of our small business uh, owners, they have no income anymore. There is no inflow coming in from anywhere because we've been under lockdown for over five weeks now, getting to six weeks. Uh, so we immediately, what I did personally was to create a, a group uh, um, um, chat on Zoom where we meet every Monday. And of course, people are free to join us every Monday. We kind of encourage ourselves. And from there, I saw that so many people needed to pivot now or perish, as in they needed to use technology to scale their impact some people needed to change their business model completely. So for example, we run an event company, right? And now people can no longer be together face to face. What do we do? We moved it to online events like this one. And because I know a lot about technology and I've been using it for six years, I realized that so many small businesses have no clue on how to manage this thing. Another thing I did as also an as an employer is I have people on my payroll. I looked at them. I said, you know what? I'm going to keep paying you guys for three months. But after three months, if nothing is coming in, I don't know what to do. And, but then as an innovator, I realized that, listen, there are gifts. There are things I do that I do for free. There are things that we do. Like we work a lot in Rise and Lead, organizing events. You know, I, I, I'm, I mean, it's a natural gift for me. Uh, so we said, I, I decided to tell them, let's start handling virtual events for people. Because people don't know how to do marketing. They don't know how to uh, promote their event, even choose the right topic to engage people. That's something I do very well. So I decided to kind of have, uh, uh, have something to move our business model a bit to start handling events like end-to-end -end event management virtually for organizations. And at least our, uh, my people can still be paid and they will be happy. They are happy about it. So my advice to every small business owner is that this is not the time to start thinking, especially if you're in Africa, you're still doing your small business. You may be thinking that it's not going to come to me. Sorry, it's going to hurt everybody. We have to face this reality. The oil prices have gone down. We, you know, government are uh, looking for loans from everywhere to keep supporting small businesses. What if the money finishes? What if every country is trying to, you know, protect what they have? So small businesses, start thinking about ways to pivot your business. Offer things online. And if I can tell you the truth, move to service. Because there are some businesses that are still going on today as we talk. And it's all due to technology. So like all the other panelists have spoken, go and upskill yourself, learn how to use technology to promote your business. If you have to shift, change your business model, do it immediately. Don't wait until you have nothing coming to you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Barry. Thank you. Um, hey John, can I? Sure, feel free, Ada. Yeah, no, um, I was just going to latch on to what Barry has um, talked about in terms of reinventing your business model. I think that's the name of the game right now. Um, you basically have to look for other ways to just generate um, revenue. Uh, 
um, Abraham also touched on the fact that the um, the the future the future is actually service driven. So whether you're producing tangible, intangible, uh, you have to look at what the environment needs, what your customers want, and then mm -hmm. just rework your model and you would definitely find something that would spring up from your various offerings so thank you yeah. thank you it, it brings me to one and um, there's a particular saying that goes that only the paranoid survive uh because i mean a few weeks ago nobody would have expected that this would have happened but some people have that paranoia to say oh there's a possibility that this could have happened and i guess they also you know restructured their business model to deliver to clients and has worked for them um still on small and medium scale businesses um funke this is for you uh, because it speaks to how we can manage um, certain things like um, tax returns uh financial reporting requirements are there specific um initiatives that tax authorities have identified that can help small businesses right now that can help with managing our taxes You know, um, so earlier in the year, there was, uh, you know, there was uh, an amendment to the tax law and uh, it was in response to the, um, you know, people have been saying some of the provisions in the tax laws are not really relevant in this um, time and age. And of course, there was a lot of um, focus on small SMEs, you know, saying that the, the tax law wasn't really, you know, friendly, you know, um, so it doesn't support their business. And so, practically, I think it, it happened um, earlier this year, where the government essentially came up with a lot of, you know, uh, some some amendments to the tax law, which really a lot of them were focused on supporting SMEs. Okay, so um, so you have instances where typically before, if even if we are not, if I mean for VAT, for instance, if you are whether you're selling or you're not selling it, at the end of the month, they expect, there are some filing obligations that are expected of you, but now they have come back to say, okay, you know what, there's a threshold, and most SMEs fall below the threshold, so they don't have you have that obligation to file those returns anymore, and of course, you know, as you as you probably know, corporate tax rate was reduced for them too, to say that, look, if, if, if your business is small, rather than pay the normal 30% tax, um, ta tax rate, we're, we're reducing it for you. So, I mean, so, so some of those things were already in law even before the COVID-19 issue came up. It's just that, you know, in Nigeria, we tend to um, see the one that really, really affects us. So the only thing people were just talking about was the increase in VAT, increase in VAT rates. Nobody was, I mean, people were not looking at the other provisions. But I think beyond the tax, because really tax, you pay tax when you have profit, right? When you have yeah. taxable well, I mean, we're talking about business survival now. We're talking about people even surviving the situation we're in. And I think this is where government has really done a lot. And that is where I will, I mean, that's my advice to the SME is to go back to what government has put in place in the last two or three weeks to kind of support the SMEs because they know that the, I mean, more established um, organizations will probably survive. You know, even if they are not making money in Nigeria, there's a headquarter somewhere that is, you know, flowing in money into them. But for the SMEs, and we're saying these are the people that are really supporting the economy. So you go back to them and say, okay, you go back to what what is the CBN saying? What I mean, what is the um, the, the the lawmakers? What are they saying? So if I if I take uh, if I take the CBN for for instance, one of the things they did was i mean you, you if you recall we have a lot of interventions you know loan interventions like, like trader money you know we have farmer money um i think there's um, about three or four of them with almost over two million beneficiaries in nigeria and what they are basically they basically told them is that you don't need to repay in the next three months okay yeah. you don't need to repay the principal yeah you don't need to replace the paper or interest so it was like because they saw this coming right and they know that those guys are not Going to be in a position to be able to pay back so immediately they just said you know what we'll suspend it um, for a while and they also looked at i mean they also have come we also have institutions like bank of industry you know um the you know um nigerian export import banks those ones are they also have some things that they have put in place to say that look just to ease the burden on smes and even the cbn itself there's there's an intervention fund i think it's about 50 billion where they're saying that, you know, this is available for all those SMEs that are directly affected 
by this. And I, I'll give you an example. So if you are an SME, but you supply, you know, maybe whatever it is, essentials to the airline, for instance, we all know that airports are closed, borders are closed. So how are they going to survive? So they say that, look, you can come to us as long as you're able to fulfill, you know, some of the conditions that we've, we've put in place, we will give you loan. And I think that is very good because initially when it started, I mean, people were saying, oh, what is government going to do? Are they going to come up with, you know, uh, interventions that can ease the burden? And I think the government was quite responsive and they are still listening. So I'm, I'm expecting that in the next couple of weeks, we're going to hear more from them. In fact, there's, there's an economic stimulus bill that is already going through the house now where they're essentially saying that, look, if you are bringing in gloves, masks, medical equipment, you know, um, things that can help manage, manage. you know, um, the crisis, you know, yeah. So we're not going to give you, we're going to say, don't pay import duties, you know, on those, we're going to have waivers on it. They are saying that, look, if you, if you have uh, a pharmaceutical uh, facility, you know, you have a, you have a, a drug, um, you know, um, you know, factory, you know, they're saying that, look, if you want to, if you want to expand, come to us, we'll give you a loan. You know, so, so those are things that you know, the government has that they've put in place just to make sure that at least, because these are the people that are really uh, the life beat of the, of the economy. So if there's anything, you can see what is happening now. Now we're still talking about the economy, right? In, in two or three weeks, there was, there, was a, I mean, there was a lockdown for two weeks and we're already seeing it manifesting in security. People are already scared. So you can imagine if this continues, right? Um, at times I get, I get so scared to even go out and take a walk because people are, people are already, you know, they are already very, they are, they are like, um, they are ready to snap. So if you don't get these people, if they don't have this, the means of livelihood, and if it continues for a long time, of course, there's going to be a security issue. And so those things have been put in place by government, but we expect that there will be more. Okay. Okay. So, um, Busaya, can I latch on to what she said? Yes, so, please. You've explained everything in details. In fact, some things that I didn't know, now I know, and I can tell my friends that run small businesses that are not here. But I mean, if I would play devil's advocate, some of the SMEs may look at those interventions and look at the criteria and say, I don't think I qualify. How can I you know, access this? And that's where collaborations and strategic alliances come into play now. Like somebody mentioned earlier, don't, it was um, very, she said, don't be rigid. If you need to, you know, tweak your business a bit. Mm -hmm. Just survive this period. And really, we're not surviving this period. This is probably going to be the new norm. I don't think we'll go back to the place where we're not using technology as much as we're using it today. So that means if I, if I don't have that, if I don't have that um, structure in my business, why not partner with somebody that has that structure? We just talked about pharmaceuticals. So say you're a brand marketer and your business is not selling currently, nobody's branding their business. You can work with that pharmaceutical to say, you know what, let me help you package your business so that you can access that intervention and you make profit from it. And you're not running out of business. So I think for SMEs, it's really for us to open our minds. Don't be too rigid that, oh, this is my sector and this is the only thing I know how to do. How can I partner with somebody else? How can I collaborate with somebody else? How can I offer my services to somebody else and make money so that I don't run out of business? Thank you. Okay, if, I may, if I may actually comment on that, just a, just one uh, comment. I, you're absolutely spot on because I mean, strategic alliances, I mean, those are things that can, at times, that's what you need to survive. So you see, I mean, I've been seeing a lot of things on social media where people are saying, look, if you want to buy groceries and all sorts of things, right? And we know that these are, these, these are, um, you know, these are outlets that typically maybe they, they are not into, into logistics. Right, yeah. but some people have come up to say, "Look, do you have the products? Right, I can help you deliver." So, and yeah. and 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 the, the the beauty of it is that as we have the lockdown now, they are still allowing. I mean, people that are delivering the logistics and people like that to be going up and down. So, I think yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. The strategic alliances will, will really play a lot, you know, um, in this um, in this situation we find ourselves. Okay, thank you so much, Deborah and Funke. Um, I have some questions from the participants. Um, one question to Adjoa. Um, well, there are two questions, but I'm going to combine it into one. Um, so the person wants to know, um, do you have a yardstick to measure corporate social responsibility in Africa generally? Um, also, uh, how can we support families, you know, that of course don't have members, family members working 
in either an organization or a big firm that you know at this point in time they probably lost their job so they are it's twofold one is what's the yardstick for csr so if we even identify companies that are not meeting that yardstick how do we approach them so okay this is actually the benchmark that you should be getting to and then the second is on an individual basis or even globally how can we help families you know that are already in the position where the breadwinner has lost their job and they have probably right now do not have anything to work with Ajua. Okay. If I should go, if I yeah. should go first. Yes. Um, I think, of course, we. I'm speaking from the perspective of working in Africa, and the real issue we have is social safety nets. That many of our countries don't have this in place. That if you lose your work, if you lose your job, there is not. Uh, we rely on our communities and our families to really fill in the gap. Now we know a lot of the places that have closed, a lot of the places where they were in hospitality, in the tourism industry, they heavily rely, that's where women are heavily concentrated. And those were many of the first places to, to, be, to be closed without any, anything in place to support families, be it on paid leave or people are told one day you come in, next day you go home. And many of these uh, were the only or the sole breadwinner is women. Now, as an office, what we are asking, what we are saying is yes, that these businesses don't have this in place because they're not obliged to. There's no law in the country that says or policy. But these are, I think somebody mentioned at the beginning, these are unprecedented times. And these are, we have to ask the government in your preparedness the preparedness that responses and the plans that we've received most of the countries have in place ways to support families and including women um, and we are talking about provision of um, basic essentials food basic food access to essential services these are obviously not adequate and then we talk about how do you get them in the first place so if there are lockdowns, if there are no public transport, if you're not allowed to use your private, even your own private vehicle because of there's a lockdown, how, do you, how are you able to even access such services if they are in place? And these are some of the many challenges our governments are grappling with and we are working with them. But as I said, on paper, there are things being put in place to make sure that women um, especially if it's pregnant women who require certain nutritional um, or lactating mothers, that these people are, these groups are not falling between the cracks. And we have been doing a lot in this regard with the humanitarian settings. You know, on our continent, we have a huge population of displaced populations and also of refugees, and we are also faced with conflict. And this COVID is not. Um, only in peace, peaceful countries is, is also in these places. And we are working with government to make sure there is full access for humanitarians to be able to get to those most in need. Now, is there a yardstick for measuring mm -hmm. social? And um, I think many of the challenges we face now is we work on business and human rights. There are, um, there are guidelines on what it means to do business and what it means to integrate human rights. And I think one of the gaps that we are seeing now is the issue of pandemics and how some of these health outbreaks and how um, companies, it cannot, I think we already talked about, we cannot go, when we go back, it cannot be business as usual. And I think this is already one of the lessons learned that if you're doing business in, um, in Africa, you cannot just shut your board, you cannot close and leave and say we'll see you in three months uh -huh. and not have anything in place for your for your employers i think some people some of you might have seen especially with the issue of european airlines yeah. uh, letting go of many of the stewards who are mostly women and telling them you come in work one day and then you're told to go and then we'll see you in three months and there's nothing in place and these women are going home to fam to families who rely on them and so even from the biggest companies, we are seeing they did not have in place such uh, measures and such policies. But I think this is definitely something that is going to be one of the major parts of lessons learned and going to ensure that this does not happen again where people are sent off home. 
but we don't have a yardstick necessarily when it comes to health pandemics as opposed to other areas of business where there's been a lot of so the mining industry there are other areas where there have been experiences in the past was on health pandemics and what we are seeing now perhaps something exists and maybe some of the participants might be aware of this but from from my perspective i'm not aware of this and especially looking at gender markers in that or indicators on the impacts on gender okay Thanks. let me ask Ada about talking about uh, in addition to what you're saying regarding job losses i'm sure there are people here who are also afraid of um, their jobs in case they lose their jobs so I'd like to ask Ada, you know, this is one of the general questions we have, you know, what would you advise them to do? Uh, because you mentioned something about future of work, you mentioned something about how they can upskill themselves. How exactly do you want them to do this? And, and why are we not talking about, especially in Nigeria, why are we not talking about government uh, supporting these people by giving them some ideas uh, like this uh, COVID stimulus that people can get from government in Nigeria because I live in the Netherlands and I know uh, people are not so scared because uh, the government has announced that they have these packages for small business people. They also have packages for uh, bigger organizations so they can continue paying salaries is there something we can do to hold our government accountable to achieve this back home in Nigeria or in any part of the African nation where you live? Ada, do you have something to say here? Okay, uh, okay, sorry for that. Yeah, I kind uh, of lost you. <laughs> I actually lost you. Oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> Maybe I can Yeah, start. so I was just so saying it was me can... or you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Hello? So, okay, I, I think I can start in terms of, I mean, because, yes, um, so from a government perspective, you know, what the government has done is that they have, so they have two um, social intervention uh, initiatives. Um, I think the first one is that they try to, I mean, the people they've termed vulnerable, yeah, most vulnerable, they try to, you know, give them some form of cash. Um, the details of how I mean, who will be eligible and so many other things. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's left for the, the team to, to mm -hmm. determine. And my understanding is that some people have started receiving, you know, um, some form of, you know, cash from, from government. Also, there's, there's also benefit in kind, which is in terms how, of... Uh, where, sorry, uh, Funke, do you know how specifically, where can people who are watching us go to apply for that or at least be ready in case... Uh, they lose their jobs. Do you know, is there any website platform where can they go to receive this uh, package? Do you have an okay, idea? I think, I think for the cash, um, I think it's just, I mean, the, the people that told me that um, they've, um, they've gotten something from government, it was a direct um, payment to their account. So I don't know how, how they were able to get it, but I think there's a ministry that handles it, which we can uh, we can find out in details and post it on the on the website. Um, so, and I also think, and I also know from a corporate perspective, I know the government has said, I mean, because government is also trying to encourage, you know, organizations not to lay people off. And so one of the things they've said is that if, if you are able to retain your employees, you know, um, so from first of, so the number of employees you have as at first of March, and it goes to the end of the year without laying anybody off. Of course, that doesn't mean that if an employee breaches any act, any, any of the provision of the Labor Act or misbehaves or resigns or the person dies, I mean, of course, you can't control things like that. But they're saying that if you are able to retain people till the end of the year, they will give you a tax rebate. So you basically look at it. So what, what they're trying to do is to say that, look, if you keep people to the rest of the year without laying them off, even though there's so much, there's a pandemic out there and things like that, they will look at you at the end of the year, they will calculate, you know, I think it's about 50% of the taxes of those employees or whatever you've paid as employee taxes and give you as a relief against your corporate income tax, which is, which can be huge, especially for, 
companies or organizations that have a lot of employees. I mean, just they just all they're trying to do is just to discourage people because once you discourage people, I mean, once you lay people off, you're only adding to the problem, right? Yeah. Um, so the I mean, the tension will only increase. So what they are doing is that they are saying they cannot give government, they can't give organizations money to pay people salary, right? But they are encouraging you that if you do this, then we'll give you a, a rebate, which is which is which is a step in the right direction. Yeah. Are they also waiving like taxes for small business owners, like uh, they are doing uh, uh, in the U.S. and here? Do you have an idea if small businesses, uh, maybe they are waiving their taxes, their tax liabilities right now? Is it? Is okay. So thing? there's no. So there's no express. I mean, waiving of ta tax liability, right? There's there's no such thing for now. But what we have, which is already in the law, and which I, is one the thing I was, I mean, what I was saying earlier, is to say that depending on the threshold, you know, your, your, your threshold in terms of your turnover, you might, you might find yourself that you're not even paying, you know, any tax or you, you're paying at a very reduced rate. So it's, 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 it's graduated, right? So those ones were already in place even before the pandemic. Because again, I mean, because there was so much pressure coming for people to say that, look, when you look at the economy, almost 50%, you know, of people that are contributing to the GDP and things like that, they are, they are SMEs. So you really, really need to focus on them because these are the people that, that engage, you know, um, you know they, they engage people, you know, they are the people that employ, you know, um, people out there. So really, you just have to encourage them. So that was in response to that. And that came up, of course, in January, not knowing that this was even going to, um, this, we are going to find ourselves in, in this, in this situation. Okay. Thank you so much. Let me hand so, over again to Busayo okay. because we have a lot of uh, questions. Yes. Well, from participants. Ada, you wanted to say something? So I was, going, I was just, of course, going to uh, write on what Funke ha had said. Uh, my gripe, and I'm not sure if I should even say this with the government, is that there's no structure in terms of the handouts, in terms of the relief that is being given out. Um, there's zero transparency. Um, the man, the average micro business owner probably doesn't even have a clue that this relief are in place and he doesn't know what to do to get them. And even if he does, it sounds as though it's like, um, I don't know, shroud in some sort of secrecy. Um, so if there's any policymaker, government um, official, maybe listening, I would ask them to be a little bit more transparent with, you know, with, with the relief. I mean, you can see in the other um, countries, it's out there, you know, there's a certain level of criteria. The criteria are, have been published. Uh, people who have received it, they struck the structure. Um, I'm hoping that this new normal will be able to put some sort of structure in place when it comes to government services. Um, in addition to, um, Funke talked about um, government offering incentives for um, organizations you not know, to lay off people. Uh, one of the things that we're looking to do in PwC is to um, provide pro bono um, business continuity services. Um, it could be advisory support services, tax services, but the con to um, SMEs with under 50 employees. The condition also is that you're not going to retrench anybody. Um, in terms of the timelines, mm -hmm. I tell you because it's still work in progress but I would ask you know people to just look out on the PwC um, social platform. Thank you very much. We're going to include all of these on uh, a newsletter we're sending every, to everyone. We are creating mm -hmm. a report from all these sections and uh, Adwa you asked uh, that question earlier. We're going to share uh, based on what our speakers are recommending and we are also getting a lot of recommendations from the chat. So we're going to share all of that with everyone. So Busaya, let's try and answer as many questions as possible uh, from the chat box, please. Okay, so we'll, we'll try. There are quite a number here. But um, I think I'll start with the first one on SMEs, uh, talking about how an SME can plan. Cor considering the current situation, you know, you have some certain costs that are fixed costs, you know, that you still have to shell out whether you're earning or not. Um, she wants to know how we can manage that aspect of budgeting such that we are only attending to the essentials of our business and not running at a loss. Um, 
Should I answer that? Or? Yes, please. Well, that's, for you. Yes, please. <laughs> that's for you. <laughs> that's for you. <laughs> so, you know, the first thing, like what I said to our community in Rise and Ladies, as much as possible, keep the money you have. Because right now, everybody is hungry. So even the internet, people are ripping off people. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote an article recently on my website and I called it COVID uh, uh, um, coaches. So everybody has become a COVID coach, which means people <laughs> are desperate. People are looking for where to make money. So they package, they just copy and paste something and then they rip you off they want to teach you how to do this they want to teach people how to do that i said to people go to where you can get those things for free i just concluded a three weeks uh, a mentorship program where i was helping women to move their businesses from offline to online and the reason is because i've experienced this thing uh, uh, you know several times when i came to the netherlands with my husband and he was transferred back again to nigeria uh, immediately, I started moving my businesses online. So I sell my Ataro spices online and I, I had to learn how to do that. The cooking workshops I was doing to introduce West African cuisine in the Netherlands, I recorded videos. I remember it was four years ago. It was stressful. But I had to really sit down and learn all of these things and it's helping me now. So adversity can actually make you oh. become wiser. <laughs> adversity can make you learn new things and become innovative this is not a time to copy and paste this is a time to look inwards inside of yourself and ask yourself what can i do to make money not where can i spend money pwc so many people are offering free classes on how to do things uh, rise and lead is offering this free mentorship uh, uh, for people uh, on, you know i said it was for women but so many people wrote me men say they would like to join so our next section i'll make it open to also be inclusive uh you just come and learn some skills on how to take your ideas yours not what you copy what you heard from somewhere you need, everything is inside of you how can you use your gifts to serve humanity right now and still make money so instead of thinking about budget and thinking about cost my my answer to you is as much as possible don't spend what you have Mm -hmm. Keep them intact somewhere and keep thinking and innovating about how can I bring in more, okay? Yeah. And also, like uh, Ada said, they have cut their expenses at home. Everybody has to. This is not the time to throw food in the dustbin. I said that to my children. This is not the time to just waste food or just keep shopping all the time. So preserve what you have, whatever you have now, put it in your savings and plan, budget and ask yourself, what can I spend for my family within a week and withdraw money like every week to make sure everybody in your family understands that things are not the way they used to be because children don't understand these things. Things are not okay. the way they used to be. So cut down on some unnecessary non-essential things from your home cut them down and you will survive you will survive you will come mm -hmm. out this thing better and stronger thank you very much so, can i also okay. just mention I, have a, some... I have a comment i just have a comment so i, I think Ibira, you you're really spot on i think i mean people are home we're working from home but of course we also have time to spend on social media so i mean if, uh. if, if i use my own um my own case as an example, I receive a lot of free, you know, um, links to free this, free that, free on how to even cook um, one kind of, you know, uh, delicacy or the other. And, and on, honestly, you just look at it and you see if it's going to, if, if you think you can benefit from it. So I will give you a, an example. I mean, um, in Deloitte, we're trying to organize, I mean, we're going to have a seminar and, and some of the things we're going to be looking at is how do you manage cash flow? Okay, because you are in a situation where you are not selling and you have a lot of costs, just like the website was. I mean, the question the person was, was, um, was asking, that is what it means. How, how, how can I survive? Do you understand? So there are questions around, you know, people are asking questions around, you know, business continuity. What happens mm -hmm. to me? You know, yeah. um, the, the truth is that this, this pandemic has really taught us a lot of things. And in fact, one of the things I've learned is that some of the processes that we go to, perhaps we don't even really need, you know, yeah. this, this. Yeah, some um, redundant this, um, processes. 
Exactly. A lot of so redundancy in our structure. If we want to be sincere to ourselves, business owners are going to sit down after this, um, this, this whole pandemic. I mean, they're going to sit down and say, what are the essential ones that we really need to keep? What are the ones that we can outsource? What are the ones that we can eliminate? The truth is that people that do the ones that they are going to eliminate, they're going to lay them off. So when you are still around now, I mean, you're still, the, the, that hasn't come. I mean, we, of course, we don't hope that it comes. You know, we don't hope that people, will, I mean, they will lay people off. But the truth is that it can happen. And so while you are at home, while you have access to internet, what are you using your time for? Some people are not even, I mean, we, we want to, we, we're saying, oh, we want to work with work with. It's on the assumption that people are very responsible. So they're not yeah. going to wake up at 8 a.m. in the morning yeah. and get on some things and begin to, you know. And at times, I, 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 you know, because you wonder, I mean, you ask people, what do they spend their time on? What do they do? You know, uh, so you find people as early. I'm not saying people shouldn't watch movies. I like watching movies, right? <laughs> but what do you do in the morning when you still have energy? So in the morning, like I was sharing, honestly, if I'm in the office, probably I get to the office around 8 and maybe around five, six, I'll, 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 I'll leave the office, right? Yesterday, um, I spent about 11 hours, okay? Yeah. So because I was having back-to-back, -back, you know, I was having meetings and meetings and conferences and, you know, some clients are still coming and saying, you know, let's discuss this, on, on, you know, on, on this. So you find that you're, you're even working more. But then I still have time to say, okay, let me look at this. People are sending me all sorts of links. And they are, they are soft skills. They are not even technical. They are not even, um, you know, they are not accounting or tax or whatever it is. They are soft skills. How do you manage it? How do you reinvent yourself? How do you manage your process? You know, how, you know those soft skills that can really help you. So people would also need to, you know, to upscale. Like Adibola said, you need to upscale. You need to look at these things so that you can make yourself useful and you'll be able to, you know, uh, to sustain your business. Get on the lines. Look at the webinars that they are doing. The, the, I mean, what Ada said, keep track. You just track it. When are they going to roll out this? How can I benefit from me? Fuken has already told you we're going to be having a webinar on, you know, on managing cash flow, business continuity, people, strategy, and all sorts of things. Just get into it, listen to people, and then you can learn from it. Thank you. There's, just, there's one more question, and it's, um, it's for... Can I mention something, please, for yes, the panelists? Let's get to the, because we have too many questions. Let's try and answer yeah. as many as possible. And, yes, I'm, and okay. what I'm going to try to do is try to infuse as many questions into one. Yes, so yes. Ada, this question, Ada, um, Irikefe, this question is for you. Um, it's, of course, you're in the business of disruption. So the question the person has is about mid to senior level career women. Um, there's life after post-COVID. Everybody's wondering, okay, right now, there are two things. People keep talking about infusing technology into your work, you know, ensuring that you remain relevant. I know we've talked about upscaling, but um, people ask you for specific skills or specific things as a need to senior level career woman, you know, who is also thinking of or who's also afraid of being replaced by techie, by the techie younger ones. You know, what are those specific things that I need to do to ensure that I'm remaining relevant i know that you wrote you made a presentation on how to enrich you know your life um, or to enrich your career yes for the future after the pandemic so if you can just help us oh. understand better what we need to do to make sure that we remain relevant specific um okay skills. okay so if you ask me um there are three areas that i would focus on um leadership okay. that you leadership. Leadership you need in terms of, I mean, this is where we are now. Um, it's full of mysteries. We don't even know what is happening. We don't know how long the lockdown will be for. Uh, we, there's no cure right now, as far as I'm concerned for Corona. It's more prevention rather than, than, than a cure. Um, so we need to um, imbibe leadership skills. And the leadership skills we cut across home, and in the work, work, workplace, um, you need you need to be able to um, develop some sort of courage to be able to f fight whatever situation it is. Um, going back into the office, there are so many things that are going to be thrown back at uh, thrown at us. First things first, I can imagine that going, especially if you're mid management, you'll be looking at your budget. There'll be mm -hmm. a need to, you know, cut down on on what you had initially uh, projected for for the year. And having the necessary leadership, financial skills, um, those will come in handy. Um, the other, other area I would uh, advise people to look into would be data analytics. 
Um, I'm not sure who mentioned it, probably Debola or Funke. There's a thousand and one mundane processes that we do just because. Uh, rather than wait for post-COVID, you know, this is a time to upskill. Um, find out, first of all, apart from upskilling, even just doing a general gap analysis or, or a review of whatever processes you have in place, are those processes, are they key? And if at all they're key, how can we use data analytics to automate? How can we use AI? So AI is another area. So by using AI, using data analytics, immediately frees us to, you know, um, be more efficient. You know, uh, right now I can tell you that um, the survey that was carried out about 60% of workers just do basic, basic tasks. Now those basic tasks, you can imagine if it's uh, consumed by a robot. I know everybody's always scared to hear, hear about robots, but consumed by AI or, or data analytics, it takes nanoseconds. You've immediately freed yourself to learn something new and also to, 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 to maybe, we keep talking upskill, you know, spend time upskilling yourself. And the other area is, like I mentioned earlier, um, it's all about the customers. It's a service driven organization. So whatever business or organization you're running, it needs to be tilted to, uh, it needs to be service driven, not only service driven, it must be customer centri um, centric. Now, if you're not thinking about your customers or you're not thinking about your market needs, you've already lost the plot. Um, so there's a, a training around design thinking and innovation. There's so many out there. Um, I know in the, the, what's it called, MIT, for instance, they have, um, how do I change my business model? How do I ensure that um, I have the requisite um, innovation ways to, 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 to meet my customers' needs? So those are the three key areas, three, maybe four areas, leadership, yeah. uh, data analytics, mm -hmm. and finance. You know, I'm looking forward to, uh, Funke mentioned cash flow. Um, I would latch on to that. Um, design thinking and innovation. I think if you have those four, you know, four uh, uh, um, courses or, or, or awareness yeah. and your skills, thank you. You know, then I think you're, you're, you're on a good path. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. I don't think you can answer any more questions. Yeah, we still do, but I want to ask uh, our panelists can we, uh, you have the time, like if anybody wants to leave at exactly uh, 8.30, they are free to leave, but for our panelists, can you offer extra time, like 20 minutes more? Is it possible? That's fine. Yeah? Ada, Ada, is, Ada, Ada cannot. Ada needs to go. <laughs> okay, Ada, you can go because we have too many questions. I just want to offer 20 more minutes to kind of answer uh, because it shows that this is a very important topic and let's do what we can to help our people. Please, yes. I'm pleading. Adu, arise, please. Yes, Thank I'm you. happy to stay on. Okay, okay. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, the next question is for Funke, and the person just wants to know, um, he's involved in PPE, importing PPEs, and he wants to have um, information on where he can get the tax relief process or import duties process, current import duties process for importing PPEs. I already mentioned that we'll send him an email with the links because Funke doesn't have those particular links right now. So I've answered him by chat, yeah? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay if, if, I may, if I may just comment, one other okay. thing, one other thing. Um, if, if what the person is bringing in is um, relevant to the current situation in terms of the COVID-19, right? So there's going to be um, the, I think the House of Rep, they've already passed the bill. So they're just waiting for the Senate. Once the Senate approves and the president assent to, uh, to it, then they, they will roll out the guideline. So but I, we expect it to be very fast. So th those ones are like a special concession, yeah. you know, and everybody is already aware. So when they show up, for instance, and they have ventilators, I mean, things that we normally hear that people use to deal with, you know, um, what's happening. They, those ones, they'll be given express um, permission to bring in those things into the country. 
But for any other importation, we will send them the link. Okay. Okay. Um, can I take one more question? I think Mr. Kadiri has one question. Okay, go ahead. Um, it's for Ada because you're about to log off. Um, the question is that there's a prominent organization that's about downsizing. Um, what advice can you offer to them so that they can approach the government to get a proper understanding of why they shouldn't or what's available to avoid that? Sorry, Busole, Busole, do you mind repeating that question? You're zooming in and out. Okay, the question is that there's a prominent organization that's about downsizing. Um, what, can, what advice can you offer to them and how can they approach the government? I think the person is talking something about trade unions. How can the trade unions approach the government such that the big organization cannot, will not downsize? This is from Victoria. Okay. Probably not the best person to comment on. <laughs> to comment on. Yeah. I can take that feedback and then come back. Oh, okay. Right. Right. So we're going yeah. to send that. We're typing a report and all yeah. the questions will be answered, even the ones we can't answer. And we're also planning. Yeah. In two weeks' time, we are bringing in government officials, policymakers, so they can answer these questions. So some of the ones we cannot change, there's nothing we can do about it. But we're going to make sure that we get the right people on board to answer your questions, please. Okay. Yeah. But the one thing I would suggest before you downsize is to just review, take an an another look at your organizations. Um, you probably have, um, mm, you probably, <laughs> you probably have areas that you can move people to. Um, you obviously want to look at the, um, the, the skill sets that are involved with the people that are, uh, that you probably earmarked for, for, for downsizing. Um, I would just say, have a review of your entire strategy. Just look at, make sure that your objective are still in line with where you currently are and where you want to go. Um, the immediate answer may not be downsizing, it may just be a reorganization. Exactly. exactly. And, um, in addition to that, um, Sayo, for that kind of organization as well, it might just be cost cutting in other places. Mm -hmm. So, if yeah. Taking off employee salary, it might be you know, practicing the lean model where the other places where you've been spending a lot, you can now cut cost. Or it might even be for you sure. exchanging some services instead of exchanging money. Sure. You sure. can maintain your cash flow. And that also even applies to SMEs. You know, the, the person that was asking us about how can I... Budgeting. Sometimes we pay for things that we can get for free. We have so much knowledge that we can also exchange for a service that we need. And that's where innovation really comes in. If you look at it critically, you might have people that you can, you know, do things for things that you don't, even if you are sleeping at the top you to do, you will do it. And then you exchange the other service that you will have paid millions for. That way, you don't have to lay off people and then your business is still running. Yeah. Thank you, Debola. Thank you, Ada. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, the panelists. I know somebody is asking a, an important question and he says he's a teacher, he's Oops. teaching somewhere. I know okay. people are not able to afford his uh, um, teachings is again, and he's asking, what can he do? Please take your teaching online. online. Start teaching on, yeah, start teaching. So stop thinking that your customers are the are only within you in Nigeria. This is one of the things because I work a lot with innovation hubs. Uh, when I try to bring them to invest in Nigeria, one of the things they said to me is Niger um, not just Nigeria, all the Africans only think about their region. That if they go to Philippines and start talking to them, those are thinking, how can I move my products to the US? How can I move my products to the Netherlands? But each time they work with Africans, Africans will always say, oh, I want to serve Nigeria. I want to serve my country. And it's help making them not to invest in these businesses. Okay. So yeah. please, let's start thinking uh, far and wide. Let's start using the internet to check what we can do, what is possible. And also, I wanted to say to the career people, another question about those who don't, uh, companies are not paying them. Uh, like I said earlier, it doesn't even have to be on the internet. 
you need to think about the service you can provide to your neighbor. Yesterday or this, was it yesterday or this? Yesterday, uh, when we were discussing about the issue of food security, uh, we had a panelist who has vertical farming. She helps people to kind of plant, you know, behind uh, at their backyards. So why can't we do that? Even if we want to invest with the little we have, we can invest in buying seeds and that vertical farming training mm -hmm. and start selling those products to our, to our neighbors. We don't even need the internet for everything. We need to be creative. We need to start thinking. And uh, like I said, for Rise and Lead, one of the things we are doing is to help everybody who comes to our platform to sh share some ideas because we found out that most people don't have ideas. Even people who are career women. I, ha I know somebody came to me and said, "How? what if she doesn't get promoted because all the work she's doing, nobody is seeing it. So I gave her a simple idea to please start bringing women in your organization together. Use Zoom and when you finish, put it on LinkedIn or put it on social media. <laughs> Yesterday she did it. She had, you know, her bosses saw that she's active. Visibility. You do, yes, you can do anything, you know, just create. So come join us on Mondays and uh, it's a free service. I will help you. Maybe that's one of my gifts, distributing I of ideas because I want you to be creative with your gift, when you do something that you are good at, people are happy to pay you for it. Mm -hmm. But when you mm -hmm. go copy what your neighbor is doing, which is some of the things I see most Africans do, it doesn't work because even when you get that job, you cannot deliver. Mm -hmm. So we, my advice for people, career people, don't wait until you're fired. You know, I used to work in a company called Shlombeja. I lost my job. And I was seven months pregnant in Nigeria. That was uh, several years ago. And immediately I started uh, um, doing a um, business center because I was a secretary. I said, okay, maybe I could do that. I wasn't passionate about that. So I didn't do it. And from there, I started selling clothes, buy travel, buy clothes, sell to my neighbors. And then I made enough money. I remembered I wanted to own a restaurant. You know, I didn't tell any of you this. Nigeria is a good country. I had a restaurant that employed over 56 people in Port Harcourt. Every, I have the money I made in Nigeria. I've never seen it since I came here. And I'm telling you that, you know, we were serving over 1,200 people in my restaurant in Port Harcourt every day. So we did a lot of catering with all the oil companies. And these are all things that because I lost my job, immediately I thought, what can I do that I know I would do very well? And I prospered in it until I came here again. So I had this, a lot of disruptions in my life and my career. And when I came here, I didn't start saying I have to own a restaurant because nobody here knew about Nigerian food. But instead I started teaching children in my, my, my children's class how to cook jollof rice. This was how I became popular here in the Netherlands, teaching people how to cook jollof rice plantain, introducing something new to them. Please, let's start being creative. And today I'm, I'm running this big organization with women who are also hungry to learn, who want to rise and who want to lead. You can start small, you can think small, but you can have a bigger vision so that you go step by step and grow to where you want to be. If you're working, I, I encourage you to please be on LinkedIn, be on social media, start writing, start con you know, engaging with other people's uh, work. You can't, people need to know you. You build from there. So one of the things we, my team are also doing is to help people manage their social media and all of that. You need to be visible. Whatever gift you have, show it to the world. You never know who is going to buy that thing you're overlooking. Think about your gift when you live here today. Start thinking inside, what can I offer to the world? The internet is your platform, please. There is no restriction. Sell to people in different countries. Sell to everyone. We're going to support you uh, because we're going to be doing this more every two weeks. And also we're going to be working with other agencies and organizations to do something uh, similar that can reach more people in Africa. So please stay tuned and uh, um, just open our emails. You never know when we are publishing something that will benefit you. 
And of course, Adebola is there, Busayo is there, they are in Nigeria, reach out to them. Reach out to us by uh, email support at riseandleadwomen.com or adebola at riseandleadwomen.com. Tell us when you have uh, issues, where do you need us to help you? We can help you, connect you with people here in, in Europe as well. But you need to have some good quality products before they listen to you. Uh, please start showing up on social media. I want to see more of you there. Uh, start by commenting on all our posts regarding this event. Tell us how you experienced it. And also start by uh, reaching out and networking. Um, I believe that um, we are all going to go through this together. I know that nobody has answers to this problem, this crisis. It's really a big one. It's on the, you know, I remember... Uh, things Fall Apart, written by Chinua Achebe. He said, things are falling apart, the center cannot hold. I know that uh, this pandemic has not hit Africa so hard. Some people are still thinking, it's not going to reach us. We are in Africa. Our, our skin is so tight, our genetics. They are saying so many things. But really, whatever hurts one nation is hurting the rest of the nations. So get prepared. Prepare your mind and say, how am I going to survive and thrive? How? Ask for help. And also be a helper. Reach out to your neighbors. Find out those ones. Somebody asked me questions about people who can provide food for their families. Please share from what you have. I said it yesterday that I started providing food for the elderly in the Netherlands. They are all Dutch people. I also make sure that the people who work for me are like Africans who I can support all our students so they can, I can pay them so they can have food to eat and do what you can with your gift. Start being that, start helping people from today when you leave this place. You will see you will be a happier person and you know, God will open doors for you that you can receive those blessings back, but stop thinking of receiving Start thinking of giving from what you have, no matter how small. Don't let anyone go hungry under your watch. We are a community. If we support each other, no one is going to die of hunger. Don't allow your neighbor's child to cry or, uh, until they come and steal your food like we heard yesterday. Please help each other. Please share what you have. And I hope to see you again in two weeks, uh, we're going to send you emails to register where we are bringing some uh, government officials, uh, policymakers, uh, uh, institutions to discuss further so that they can answer our questions directly. And we are also writing an article to submit to you know, the relevant bodies so they can see what we are able to discuss using this platform. So thank you so much for contributing to the conversation. Really, your voice counts. And we're going to keep in touch with you and we're going to see more of you. And when we come to Lagos, myself, Adua, uh, uh, and all the other people, like uh, Mr. Atman is here from the U.S., we are coming to Lagos very soon. As soon as this pandemic is over, I'm the first person that will renew my ticket and I'll be in Lagos. I know I'm just going to be in Lagos live and to see all of you uh, in that summit. Thank you. God bless you. And bye-bye. Thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you to our panelists. Please, you did a Thank very you. great job. And that's why uh, you kept our uh, attendees engaged. Mm -hmm. We're going to Thank share... You. I'm going to reach out to you if you know of any platform, any website link where people can go for more information, information. We will collect it together and put on our platform. We will also tell people where to buy things like through e-commerce. Like, okay, you can buy vegetables from here. You can buy this from here. If you need help, we as an organization, mm -hmm. we have decided to help to, to, to help people who are in need during this time. And one of the things we are doing is uh, Adebola is going to um, uh, organize this, that two of our speakers yesterday, Ndidi Muneli of uh, Sahel Consulting and... Um, uh, so, what they have, okay, so they have a platform where they are already distributing food, distributing you know, uh, ingredients. We don't want to create a new platform. It doesn't work like that. So we're going to take some money that any money we get some percentage we're going to 
give them to keep helping the uh, uh, less privileged. And I'm going to also tell you, if you want to be a part of it, if you want to contribute in any way to this, let's collect it together. Uh, Adebola will share that on the newsletter uh, to any Nigerian account where you can put, no matter how much money, we will put it together and we'll give to Ndidi Wuneli uh, uh, what they are doing. We are also, we are sharing the money to between Ndidi's platform and um, Crowdy Invest. Crowdy Invest. We are platform. So we would appreciate if you are a part of it, even if you don't want to do that, please look after your neighbors. It's very, very important. You know, I'm speaking from my heart and I really want you to be the change you want to see in our world. Our government, they do not have all the answers. I'm telling you, this is not a time to point fingers at our leaders. They are not doing the right thing. They are copying here. They don't know what to do. That's why they are copying the lockdown from Europe. Exactly. But we are also going to give them uh, all the advice that people hear, all your opinions that they should not copy directly from Europe because there is, we have different cultures, uh, the different ways of communication and also ways to reach to people in rural communities so that no one is left out, which is what uh, Adua is also working on. I'm sure they are working on something uh, to make sure that all the girls who are going to uh, uh, be out of school because of this problem that they are able to go back to school. Hi, and Adua. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 God bless you. I do I want to say anything? Okay. So, um, any last words from anyone? I've, okay. I've covered everything. I think I've spoken enough. Yeah, I, I'll just say one thing. I mean, be the light that the world is desperately looking for. Like um, Iberia said, Let, let's make that um, required impact that um, the world needs, and let's make the world a happy place for everybody because who, any other person's win is actually our own win as well so we can't yes, win, okay. win in silos so there, there's power in more there is power in the community so let's let's consciously um, call, um, inculcate the habit of forming a community and helping everybody that needs something it's, it's for everybody's benefit thank you so much for joining you guys thank, thank you all so much stay safe and stay bye. safe <laughs> enjoy this section bye bye we love you bye all. bye